So there are several different types of chemical bonds, but the ones you definitely should know for this class are ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and covalent bonds, there's a subtype of covalent bonds. So polar covalent bonds are still covalent bonds, but they're a little special. And then hydrogen bonds, these are not the same as polar covalent bonds. They're related, but not the same. So again, ionic bonding, this is when, again, when it, how do you get an ion? That's when an atom has an unequal amount of protons and electrons, right? So with protons and electrons, what happens here is that over here, we have when you have this transfer of this electron from sodium to chloride, it loses electron and chloride gains electron, but now the overall charges are plus one and negative one on the sodium and chloride respectively. So this positive and negative charges attract each other. And then over here with ionic bonding, so this is what happens if this happens over and over again. So we have all of these positive sodium ions linked to, or actually like attracted to, negative chloride ions. And this is why salt has that crystalline cuboidal structure. Because if you keep on forming these ionic bonds and attractions together, this is where you can pack all of these sodium and chloride ions together. And that's in your OpenStax version. Okay, so covalent bonds, compared to one uh, atom ripping off or have, have transferring one electron to another atom, now they actually share a pair of, of electrons. So here we have a single covalent bond between two hydrogen ions. So the thing about electrons is that they don't like to be alone. And if you want more in detail, you can read about valence shells. Again, so Electron pairing, that's very important. Like Electrons don't like to be a, by themselves. That's why we have things, that's also the basis behind things we call free radicals, but that's a little advanced chemistry for this point. But basically, electrons, this is the main point. Electrons are very important for forming bonds between atoms. So with covalent bonds, what we have here is that, here what we showed, this is a little more detailed version of those same bonds we saw earlier. So here we have two hydrogen atoms sharing a pair of electrons, and here we have two oxygen atoms sharing two pairs of electrons. So there is actually, this is why it's a double covalent bond. Thing is that these are same, 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 same. So these atoms within these, these um, structures and molecules, they're actually sharing these electrons equally. And polar covalent bonds, well, what we have here is that, so. What I'm getting at for with this one, we have a water molecule, right? H2O. But the thing about oxygen is it likes to hold on to electrons a little more. So it's a little stronger at pulling electrons toward its structure than the hydrogen ion atoms. Now, here's the, why do I kind of show it like in that sort of buzzing around? Well, remember that electron clouds, these electrons are actually buzzing around, so they're not always orbiting. They actually ha can appear at different points in that electron cloud. Now the thing with oxygen when it's bound to two hydrogen atoms, these electrons, even though it, we're showing them kind of evenly shared over here, they actually spend more time with that oxygen atom. So this is why in a water molecule, the oxygen atom in a water molecule is slightly negative, and this is why it's using that lowercase delta it's referring to a concept called dipole. Again, if you're taking Chem 161, you'll get very familiar with that. And over here, so since the electrons, which are negatively charged, again, this is why the oxygen is slightly negative, ne negatively charged, the hydrogen atoms, since they spend less time with that negative atom, or neg negative um, electron, so remember, the nucleus of a hydrogen ion, or hydrogen atom, is positive, right? Because it has a proton, therefore it's positive. So if you have a positive charge here, but the, electro the electron with the negative charge spends more time away from the positive charge, now the positive charge becomes a little more positive. So this is why it's slightly positive at the hydrogen atoms. And there are other types of polar covalent bonds, so it's not just about water. The wa polar covalent bonds in water are very important, which I'm sp why I'm spending a lot of time on it. But things like nitrogen can also form polar covalent bonds. So nitrogen can also have an unequal sharing of electrons with hydrogen. And same with fluorine. So this is why they're cut. So again, this is often a re big, this is why a lot of people get confused between hydrogen bonds and polar covalent bonds because they think it involves hydrogen atoms. 
therefore it's a hydrogen bond, which isn't quite correct. So what we have here with polar and covalent bonds, polar covalent bonds are talking about this point over here, where you have the unequal sharing of electrons between two atoms. So not necessarily just water and, or oxygen and hydrogen, but it can involve unequal sharing between other elements as well here. Okay, so now we're going to talk about hydrogen bonds. So this is, again, this is where whoever named this, they kind of like threw a little curveball at a lot of people learning chemistry for the first time. Even I was like a little confused when I heard this first. I'm like, okay, it's hydrogen bonds, but why, why isn't this a hydrogen bond? Well, it's because it's a polar covalent bond. Hydrogen bond actually refers to, remember like how ionic bonds, positive attracts negative? Well, same with hydrogen bonds, except it's a partial positive and partial negative charge. So what we have here is that this positive is attracted to a negative here, this negative is attracted to a positive, this positive is attracted to a negative. So we have these partial positive and negative charges, but they're not actually sharing electrons. So this is the big difference between hydrogen, or one of the big differences between hydrogen bonding and polar covalent bonding. So you have polar covalent bonds within a water molecule, but between water molecules, you have hydrogen bonding. So it's an attraction due to partial negative and positive charges between molecules. So versus a ionic bond where you have a full positive or negative charge, or actually sometimes you have, yeah, you have a full positive or negative charge depending on the ion. This is due to that slightly negative, slightly positive thing due to the unequal sharing of electrons. So this is a way to comp compare and contrast these. So type of chemical bonds. So Covalent bonds can be also like subtyped into nonpolar covalent and polar covalent. Nonpolar covalent are like the bonds we saw where electrons were equally shared, like in the O2 molecule or the H2 molecule, oxygen and hydrogen gas. So there's no overall electrostatic charge because the electrons are evenly distributed between the two atoms. Whereas polar covalent bonds, there is a slight electrostatic charge at different parts of or different atoms of a molecule. So in the case of water with H2O, the oxygen is slightly negative and the hydrogen is slightly positive. And then in the hydrogen bond, so there is an electrostatic charge involved, but instead of being within a molecule, it's between two different molecules. So that's why we have a hydrogen bond and ionic bond. These are involved full ionic charges. So again, they're always going to be some sort of integer, plus one, plus two, negative one, negative two, negative three. It's not going to be par partial. All right, so a few questions in the chat. Where do we locate the Zoom codes for the lab? So it should be in your Laolima site or your TA emails it. If you joined the, the lab late, you might want to email your TA because maybe they sent out the Zoom code at the very beginning of the sem semester. All right, and should you get the year one if you plan to go fill one for two? Again, I think the year subscription saves you a few dollars. So again, if you're really intending on taking the full year, year of anatomy and physiology and seriously committing to it, then it might be more economical for you there. And I believe like Top Hat, if other classes are using it, if you're subscribed to Top Hat Pro, now Top Hat test is per class, but I think Top Hat Pro lasts you for everything like for, for or as many classes as you want within your subscription range. You might want to check with the top hat and support at tophat.com. All right, now let's talk about chemical reactions. We talked a lot about these bonds and remember like I said, bonds between atoms are like relationships, right? So chemical reactions are like th dynamic things that have and changes that happen in relationships. So the thing is that with a chemical reaction, these bonds are formed or broken. Like bonds are formed and broken between people all the time. Same with atoms. So reactants is where you start, your starting point. So these are the reactants and the products. When you produce something, you produce a product, right? So reactants are the start, starting materials, products are the end result. Now metabolism, there's many, when you talk about someone, say, like, ask them what metabolism is, they might say like, oh yeah, it's how fast you burn off things and your calories and whether you're skinny or you're overweight or other things like that. Well, the physiology definition of metabolism is the sum of all the chemical reactions occurring in your body. 
So your body has all of these chemicals that, you know, well, you are made out of chemicals. And there are many of these reactions that are fueling your body, repairing your body, and keeping your cells alive. So all of those put together is what we call metabolism. So it's not just about calories and energy expenditure. It does involve it, but we're talking about all the chemicals. So the types of chemical reactions I want you to know, so there are main categories. There are other types of chemical reactions, but these are ones you should definitely know for this class. So decomposition reaction, and also known sometimes called a catabolic reaction. So when you think of a catastrophe, that's when things fall apart, right? So when something decomposes, what happens? Well, when you think of something like an organism, like you see leaves decomposing, you think of them rotting away and breaking down. So that's what happens during a decomposition reaction. Things start to break down into smaller parts. Now, it doesn't necessarily, this is a type of decomposition, but this is the way you can think of it. Decomposition means things are falling apart. And then synthesis, the opposite of that is what we call a synthesis reaction, sometimes referred to as an anabolic reaction. So the opposite of something breaking apart is building something up, right? So when you think of anabolic, what do you think of? You usually, sometimes you might think of anabolic steroids or things that bring, build up something. So what we have, when you think of synthesis though, you're thinking of making something and out of smaller parts. So when you're synthesizing something like this with this 3D printer, you're building something up. So decomposition, breaking down, synthesis, building up. Now an exchange reaction, well, Exchange reactions are what happens when you exchange something. Like say you exchange like, a, like dollars for pesos or like you exchange Canadian dollars for American dollars. Well, you're doing so, you're giving something, but you're get, also getting something in return, right? So exchange reaction, you have some sort of exchange. It's not that we're completely building something or giving things away or things are breaking down or being built up. There is some sort of switcheroo. And a reversible reaction, well, if they're like things like the decompo decomposing food we saw earlier, is that food going to go from rotted back to full fresh fruit again? Well, it probably has to go through that whole cycle of the life cycle of a plant. But a reversible reaction is something that can go back and forth. So, okay, so analogy time. I love analogies. So remember, I like to... I like to and draw an analogy between chemistry and atoms and people and relationships. And chemical reactions are all about the changes in relationships between atoms. So what we have here, we start off with two reactants and when after their products are, now we have two reactants that came together to form a new molecule. So this is a synthesis reaction. So when you're synth synthesizing a new relationship, you're building a new bond, right? So this is what a synthesis reaction does. It builds new bonds to create a new molecule. So this is why it's kind of also sometimes called an anabolic reaction. You're synthesizing a new bond. You're synthesizing a new relationship between these atoms. So th again, these are the reactants. So you have two reactants, but now you have one larger product that's bigger than both of those reactants individually. Now, what's the opposite of that? Remember how I said the opposite of synthesis is decomposition? Well, what's the opposite of making a new relationship? The opposite of making a new re relationship is breaking up, right? So decomposition reaction is like that. It's like a breaking up between atoms. So here's our reactant. It started off with these two atoms that were in a relationship and they're bonded together, but now they broke apart. So reactant, and now you have products they are smaller than, individually smaller than the initial reactant. So this is also why it's called a catabolic reaction. Now exchange reaction, so what happens here? Well, do we necessarily break these apart into smaller molecules? Not really, but what we have here is that we have these initial reactants, but notice that one component, or actually two components, or you could actually think of it either way, Notice that component switched between these two bonds. So I these are long off the air, but back in like the early 2000s, there were all these like trashy reality TV shows where people would actually like trade like their partners for a week or so, and then all this drama would happen. 
So it's kind of like that. So what happens is that you switch partners and this is what exchange reaction is like. The reactants and products are different and you still have the same individual components, but now they're rearranged differently. So this exchange reaction is some sort of switcheroo. Okay, and then now, now if, if you know, if you've had a friend like this, remember my analogy is that chemical bonds are kind of like relationships and you might know somebody who's been in this type of relationship. So they start out in a new relationship, they break up, they get together, they break up, they get together, break up, they get together. Sometimes they're more broken up uh, and taking a break more than they are together. Sometimes they're together more often than they're breaking, broken up. So these sort of back and forth reactions where they have caught these kind of being put in or they're get forming new bonds and breaking new bonds, this is what we call a reversible reaction. So it can go both ways. You can have a synthesis, you can have a de decomposition. Either way, this reaction isn't just, what, it's not one way street. You can build a new molecule or you can break it up into in a catabolic reaction. So that's what reversible is and this is why in, a, in the chemical notation, when we're showing these like reactions, this is why there's a double arrow because it can go either way. So these are, yeah, that, that stuff, it, by the way, if you're in that, please get, really think about your choices because yeah, that sort of codependency is toxic. Oh, yeah, I agree with the chat. So yeah, that, there's already enough stress in the world, you need that additional stress. So these are the basic categories of chemical reactions you should know for this class. Especially when you get to fill 142, there's a lot of reversible reactions. Actually, reversible reactions are very important for things, uh, chemical solutions we call buffers. Okay, so now we can go to Top Hat. So for Top Hat, we can start our first top hat questions of the day. I love this. All right, so then let's pull up my browser. Where is it? Oh, here we go. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, it's been. I'm a little rusty after the summer, so here we go. Okay, so. If you want to, I'll pause it real quickly, and what we have here is, yep, so you have the join code over here, so you can join over here, and you can enter your response in your app. So you can actually do this from desktop, or there's also in the, in the, um, you can also, I think there's a mobile app as well. So you will have assignments on Top Hat, but you'll also have quit. The funny thing about Top Hat is not so, it's not as well suited for like quizzes you can take over and over again. So assignments are more like do at your own pace and Top Hat has all these cool types of questions you can do. So that's one thing you can, you can um, do with. Okay, so A plus B makes a, a new molecule AB. So what type of re reaction is this? Well, multiple things can apply to this and the correct answer is, looks like most of you got the right answer. So it is a th synthesis reaction because you're forming a new bond bef between these individual components A and B, but it's also anabolic because now you're building and synthesizing new bonds and building a new larger molecule. So that's why it's also anabolic. It's not catabolic because it's not falling apart and it's not reversible because look at that arrow, it's one way in this equation. Alright, so it looks like people are getting the hang of it. And any quizzes coming up? Yes, you will have a quiz this week, but it will be on Laulima instead. Alright, so then here we have metabolism and this from OpenStax shows like, okay, catabolism is breaking something up, down, but an anabolism is bringing, an anabolic reaction is building something up. And don't worry if you miss it, then you can always like, you can always, uh, we'll have more questions as well. And remember, top hat questions count for nothing. So they're more to like apply your knowledge. So the thing is that when you're actually engaging your brain and thinking about something, your previous knowledge actually sticks in your head and, and also 
it sticks in your head better and you remember it more. So this is why it's more for your benefit, but don't worry about being a high stakes things like, oh my God, I don't know the answer. Again, it's up to make you kind of fire up those neurons and really think about a concept. All right, so then let's talk about enzymes. Yeah, so the question is closed because we have to get on with our lecture. Don't worry, there'll be more. So enzymes, so here we have uh, a schematic. And the thing about physiology is that people, physiologists and chemists, and they, they, they love graphs. And here we have is the progress of reactions. So basically, it's like this, you can think of this as time. So you start off in the beginning with a reactant, then you end up with a product. But the thing about this is that in order to actually go from a reactant to a product, you need a little energy. So over here is the energy you would need without an enzyme, and here's the energy you would need with an enzyme. So you notice that, I like to think of it like pushing a car over a hill. So notice that without the enzyme, you need to more energy to push a car up a steeper hill. Whereas with this smaller hill, you need less energy to push a car up a small, uh, smaller hill with less of a slope. So this is a way that we can think of it. So here we have the enzymes, and I like this one from OpenStax. I'll give the point to OpenStax in this per this point. So what we have here is that you need more energy again to push up into a up a up a steeper hill and with a higher summit than you need with a lower smaller hill with a lower slope here. So what we know is enzymes. They lower the energy to push the reaction to its products. Now, thing is, that what's the end point I'm trying to get over here? So chemical reactions need energy, and they need energy to it. So they don't. They, some can happen with like ambient energy, or actually, I think that's getting a little too advanced. But thing is that chemical reactions they need energy. Sometimes it's a little bit. Sometimes it's a whole lot. Enzymes change the game by lowering the amount of energy you need. So here's an example I like to use for analogy for a chemical reaction and enzymes. So here's our reactant. It's our starting point. So here's a bottle with a bottle cap. And when you want to drink from the bottle, what do you want? You want to separate the bottle from its bottle cap, right? So you want to get from point A to point B. And so how do you open it? Well, you could open it with your hand, but is that very efficient? How much energy would that use? You probably need a killer grip and a lot of energy and leverage to open that ball with your bare hand. And you probably would end up with something like this. How do most people open the, or actually, next? how's our next question? So our next question. So the thing is that you want to go from your bottle to that's closed to a bottle that's open. So if we're using this analogy, if this were a chemical reaction, which word would describe it better? Decomposition or synthesis? And how are enzymes created? Oh, that's a great question. We didn't get to cell biology yet, but most, not all, but most enzymes are proteins. So enzymes are made by your cells, but how they, are they made? We didn't quite get that to that yet, but you can read ahead if you want to. Okay, and don't worry if you don't get in on time. Again, I, we can't spend all our time on top hat questions. We have to get through the lectures as well. So actually, let's go back to our browser. So what's the answer? So decomposition or synthesis. So why would it be a decomposition? Well, look at it. So the correct answer would be decomposition because you're actually breaking apart a larger molecule and breaking bonds between a larger molecule to make it into smaller parts. Even though this part is very close in size to this original reactant, you're still breaking apart one thing into two individual parts. So this is why it's like a, a decomposition reaction. Avogadro's number and moles, I think I'll leave that for your Chem 161 because it's nice to know, but am I going to ask you to calculate a molar solution? That's more of a Chem 161 question. 
All right, so enzymes. So what are enzymes? Most enzymes are proteins, not all, but at this stage you can think of them like they are special proteins, but what do they do? So here's our reactant, and an enzyme is something that makes it easier to go from the reactants to the products. So remember, like you can open a bottle with your, <laughs> with your bare hand, and if it's not the type that screws off, you can, with like a lot of force and energy, try to get that bottle cap off but if you have something that gives you a mechanical advantage, what is this going to do? Well, do you need to spend as much energy to use a bottle opener? Nope, you just use leverage and it transfers, it, it fits onto this initial reactant and pops it off to form these products. So enzymes, they're basically, the, you still have the same reactant. You start off with uh, initial reactant in this case and you still um, end up with the same products, but did you spend the amount of same amount of energy as when you're trying to open this, do this reaction without uh, enzyme? So this is my main point for this. So enzymes, they're special proteins most of the time, but they make chemical reactions more efficient. So again, they still the same reactant, still the same products, but two different ways. Which way requires more energy? Well, the one without the enzyme, without the efficiency, this is going to cut, you still end up with the same overall reaction. But the one without the enzyme, you need to spend more energy, and the one with the enzyme, you need less energy. Or if you're using the hill example, you can think of it as like, if you're using, um, pushing up the hill with like, a, let's see, what would be, well, I have to think about that analogy, forget about what I said, but use this analogy for now. So again, if you look at, like I said, top hat questions do not count for, during the live session. They do not count for or against you. So again, these are for like, I know it sounds like this like for fun, but that's pretty much what they are, is to kind of get your brain thinking. And also it says in the syllabus that top hat questions don't count for anything. Or top hat co live questions don't count for anything. Because again, not everyone's able to make the live questions, live sessions sometimes. All right, so then enzymes are catalysts. So catalysts are not, so this is one of those things like all A's are B's, but not all B's are A's. So enzymes are a type of catalyst, and you can have catalysts that aren't enzymes, but basically catalysts are things that kind of help chemical reactions occur. So again, most enzymes are proteins. There are exceptions like your ribosomes. And enzyme names typically end with ASE. So not always, there are exceptions, but a lot of enzymes, they end with those three magical letters. And again, here's what we're showing. Now, do enzymes always break things apart? No, actually, if you did, things only broke apart, you, wouldn't, you would have a hard time doing a lot of the anabolic reactions and synth synthesizing things in your body. So enzymes can also stitch things together. They not only can help with decomposition reactions, in this case we have a synthesis reaction. You have two su substrates or there are two reactants and then you have a final product. So we're actually doing an anabolic or a synthesis reaction in this example of an enzyme. So you can have enzymes that help with anabolic reactions and you can also have enzymes that help with catabolic reactions. Now, Here's another example I like to use. So here we have paper and staples. So here's are your reactants. And then what you want to do is, what do you want to do with all this paper and staples? You want to make a product, right? You want to staple all these papers together. Now, what's the enzyme in this case? Is that you might use a stapler. So next top hat question. So if this was a chemical reaction, which word would describe it better? Decomposition or synthesis? So you start out with paper and staples, and then you use an enzyme, the stapler, to make a product.
Okay, and don't worry about getting the wrong answer. It's better you get things wrong in the live questions that don't count than on the actual homework or on your exams. Alright, so most of you said synthesis and most of, most of you are correct. Why? Because you're making a bond, new bond between your reactants. So you're bonding these reactants and putting them together. This is why it's a synthesis reaction because you're building a new bigger structure than from the smaller individual parts. So that's why this is kind of like a synthesis reaction. Okay, so then we have here, but how can you go from this reacts? So in this previous example, the paper and the staples were your reactants and you formed a new product by forming new bonds to make a larger product. But you can also undo this reaction. So you can actually go from this, where now the reactant is are your staple papers, and then pull, pull them apart to form the to have individual papers and the staples. And what enzyme could you use for that? Well, that could be this staple remover. So what we have here is a different type of reaction. Our next top hat questions? Or oh, actually, not let me rewind that a bit. So top hat question will come up soon. But this is why my main point here is like you can have enzymes that work with the same general products and reactants, but you can also have enzymes that undo the activity of other enzymes. So in our previous example, the stapler was the enzyme. But in this other example where it's actually now catabolic, because again, you're breaking apart this initial reactant to form smaller products you have a different enzyme that does the opposite. So you can have often pairs of enzymes. One does the synthesis reaction and one does the decomposition reaction. Okay, so top hat question. Which one of these is most likely to be an enzyme? And if it says it closed, that means you missed the time window. It might be due to lag, and this is another reason why top hat live questions don't count. Sometimes if you're, if you're on the other side of the world, you're probably missing the time window. Or if you're using a really slow Wi-Fi, that also makes a really long ping as well. And so if that's happening, you might want to check your browser or internet speeds as well but yeah sometimes you have to refresh things as well or close other apps if you have multiple apps open on your mobile phone or in your browser okay so which one of these mo all of these are molecules but which one is most likely to be an enzyme hey looks like most of you got it so catalase and catalase is a classic enzyme in fact, it's one of the things that a lot of microorganisms use to break apart hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. So this is an enzyme, yeah. But not all enzymes have ASE, but this is a dead giveaway that a molecule is an enzyme. All right, so... All right, so again, big giveaway, ASE typically give, gives away that molecule as an enzyme. And remember, like in my paper and staple analogy, you can have enzymes that help with catabolic reactions that, and decomposition reactions, but you can also have enzymes that help with synthesis and anabolic reactions as well. And in the time we have left, let's talk about water molecules. So again, <laughs> where we have... The fluids in our body are water-based, so this is why I'm spending a lot of time on water. Remember that water within one water molecule itself it has these polar covalent bonds leading to slightly negative charges on the oxygen and slightly positive charges on each hydrogen atom. Now these polar covalent bonds, again, why? Because these electrons, oxygen likes to hold on to electrons a little more than the hydrogen does, so with these electrons spending more time here, Oxygen is a little negative, thus making hydrogen a little positive on, or each hydrogen a little positive. And again, refreshing that hydrogen bonding is referring to this partial negative and partial positive charges being attracted to each other. In the case of water, it's due to the hydrogen being slightly positive, 
being attractive to other water molecules or other molecules that are slightly negative. So why does this matter? Well, your cells are about 70% water. And the human body, depending on your age, your sex, or your, also your height and weight and body composition, is about fit half to a little over half water. But the thing is that chemicals also need to be transported throughout your body, and water is a great way of doing that. So water is the main carrier of chemicals in your body. So the thing is that now you have to talk about these two terms. And these two terms are very easy to get mixed up. So when you have a solvent, that refers to something, some sort of chemical or substance that you use to dissolve other chemicals. So a solvent is the thing doing the dissolving. And for fill one for one and one for two, I mean, there might be, if you're talking about the chemical sense, if you, like chem 161, 162, when they're not necessarily talking about cells and the body, they might have other solvents. But for this class, water is pretty much the primary solvent you're going to be talking about. So when I talk about solvent, I'm pretty much always talking, almost always talking about water. We're not talking about like, or maybe if you go into pharmacology, we talk about like solvents being lipid based, but for this class, water is usually what we're referring to. So solute is what's being dissolved. So the solvent is the thing doing the dissolving and the solute is what's being dissolved in the original solvent. So again, remember in this class for this year, water is a primary solvent. So the solutes in your body, these are what be, are being dissolved in water. So when you have dissolve a solute into a solvent, you have a solution. So here we have a salt crystal. Remember, with all those ionic bonds, you have salt, sodium and chloride forming all these ionic bonds just due to their positive and negative charges being attracted to each other. Well, what also has positive and negative charges or partial positive and negative charges? Water molecules also have partial positive and negative charges. So remember, those polar covalent bonds make in water make the oxygen atom in each water molecule slightly negative. So if you throw sodium chloride into water, what happens? Well, this, again, slightly negative charge is going to attract the, is going to help to break apart this, these ion bonds between sodium and chloride. And these negative charges around what, uh, on the oxygen atom of water they're actually going to surround these sodium ions. So yeah, it's going to be from something we call hydration spheres. But my main point here is that notice that these water molecules, due to their partial negative charge, they're actually able to interact with other charged particles as well. So this is why salt dissolves in water, because these, these charges are being attracted to the partial positive and negative charges of water that helps to break them apart and surround them and prevent them from forming these ionic bonds again. And so again, these are called hydration spheres and is this really important? Well, maybe you're looking at the molecular and if you're going to molecular sciences, but this is just FYI. So then we have to talk about concepts called hydrophilic and hydrophobic. So when you have something like, when you say someone's a bibliophile, they like to they like to read stuff, right? Or if they are a biophile, they like life, they like nature. So hydrophilic means some sort of, comp when we're talking about hydrophile, now this is where it gets a little confusing because in this case, it's not necessarily talking about hydrogen, but we're talking about the root word hydro, which refers to water. So when you have a molecule that's hydrophilic, that means it likes associating with water. So things like those sodium and chloride ions, they're hydrophilic. They like dissociating and associating with those water molecules. And hydrophobic, so this is the opposite. So that means that they don't like associating with water. So hydrophilic means refers to when we're talking about com compounds and molecules in the human body. That means these are molecules and chemicals that are able to dissolve in water. So in other words, they're solutes that can dissolve in water. And hydrophobic, so these are the chemicals that are, at least in the context of your body, they don't quite easily dissolve in water. So they don't, it's hard for them to mix in evenly with uh, the water and fluids in your body. So this is what we call hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity, whether something can dissolve in water or whether it has a hard time dissolving in water. 
And so let's see, we already caught, talked about polarity. So again, referring to that, and polarity is caused by that uh, polar covalent bonds. So this is referring to those partial electric, electric charges. So chemicals that tend to have, have ionic charges or polar charges, they tend to be hydrophilic because why? Well, if they have partial or full negative and positive charges, then they're going to be attracted to the full positive and negative, or not full, the partial positive and negative charges on water. Whereas chemicals that don't barely have any electric charge, well, they tend to be hydrophobic. And why is that? Well, if they're neutral, then you don't have the positive-negative attraction. A positive plus a neutral charge, there's no real rea real attraction. If you have a negative charge and a neutral charge, there's no real attraction there either. So basically, you need some sort of positive-negative interaction for two molecules to be attracted to each other in hydrophilicity or, or, not, or when something dissolves in water. So you need some sort of charge, something for water to grab onto. Okay, I know that was really quick, but again, we have to cover, this is why it's really hard to, this is probably one of the hardest lectures to give, because I have to cover an entire textbook in two days, and that's in one chapter as well. Hard to, for the authors to write as well. Okay, so pH, we're going to just introduce it at a very basic level right now. This becomes very important, especially in Phil 142, and if you're going to any sort of medicine, pharmacology, or nursing, you definitely need to know pH. But what is pH? It's a scale used to measure the amount of protons in a solution. So basically the concentration of it. And remember from our atomic structure, protons are the same as hydrogen ions as the same as H and H+. And why is that? Again, to review, here we have a hydrogen ion that somehow has a equal amount of all the subatomic particles. So one proton, one electron. But if you have a hydrogen ion, what happens? Well, a hydrogen ion will, is going to have an unequal amount of electrons and protons. The most common hydrogen ion and most physiologically relevant one is H+. So you don't have an electron. And remember, in our universe, most hydrogen does not have a neutron. So what are you left with? If you have a hydrogen ion, you have a naked proton. So again, this is why H+, is the same thing as protons, or if you're listening to my lectures or anybody else's lectures, you often see that protons and H plus are sometimes used interchangeably. And so what about acids? So here we have hydrochloric acid and the chemical formula for that is HCl. And here we have carbonic acid, and so we have a carbon here and also oxygen molecules and another hydrogen. And here we have a more complex citric acid. So these are all types of acids, but what happens when you, these are all water soluble, but what happens when you throw them into water? Well, the thing is that when you throw them, dissolve them in water, is that these hydrogen ions pop off of the original structure. So what happens is that you're actually releasing protons into the solution when you take any of these acids and throw them in water. Now the pH scale, well, what does that do? So the pH scale actually measures how much, what's the concentration? So how many of these protons do you have packed into a certain volume of this solution? So what we notice is that this is where pH is kind of tricky. The lower the pH, the more protons you have in that solution. The higher the pH, the fewer protons you have in that solution. So the common misconception is that a neutral pH, so seven is a neutral pH, but it doesn't mean that you don't have any hydrogen altogether. It's actually saying relative to pure water, you have that amount of hydrogen ions in that solution. So 10 to the negative seven concentration of hydrogen ions. So again, neutral does not mean you don't have any protons altogether. It just means you have this certain reference amount of, or a cer certain level uh, and concentration of protons. So when you go to the acidic side, what happens? Well, you notice that the pH drops. So the lower the pH, the more concentration of protons you have compared to a neutral solution. And notice that each of, this is exponents of 10 to the negative six, five, four, three, two, one. So it actually involves exponents. So every time you change one pH, 
a pH that has a, a solution that has a pH of 6 actually has 10 times the protons as a, a solution that has a pH of 7. And let's see, so here on the opposite side, well, now that you notice that as you get more basic and alkaline, that the pH goes up. So this is where it's kind of counter counterintuitive. The higher the pH, the less protons you have. And so here we have neutral. So when you go from pH of 7 to 8, so the pH of 8 actually has one-tenth of the proton concentration as a p solution that has a pH of 7. And notice that blood is slightly basic. So that's what we have here. Now how we determine pH, I'll try to end on this part. It involves logarithms, and this little negative sign over here is why pH is kind of counterintuitive at first. If you, I'm, now, I'm not going to ask you to do logarithms on the test and on, in this class because it's not algebra too. But this, if you really want to know why pH is that way, it's due to this. So this negative sign and the logarithms, this is why pH has that kind of inverse like the more concentrated um, uh, solution is with protons, this is why the pH gets smaller and smaller. So lower pH, the more hydrogen uh, uh, protons in solution, and the more protons in solution, the more acidic the solution. So again, this is, if you're first learning this for the first time, it is, it often confuses a lot of people. But once you kind of get it in your head that Okay, pH is like the lower the pH number, the more protons you have, then you're pretty much set.